since I usually mention him at the end of the episode when many of you may be distracted, I'm starting this episode by saying a special thanks to John K. Schneider for his invaluable suggestions, support, and for creating the Chicago History Podcast logo and the art used on the social media pages. He can be found at Angel Eyes Art JKS on Instagram or via email at Angel Eyes Art JKS at Gmail. Com. Now then. In September of 1968, Tammy Wynette released her most successful song, Stand By Your Man. Earlier that year, a woman in Naperville, Illinois, lived those song lyrics when she stood by her man, her husband, who prosecutors claimed had tried to kill her with a bomb in a suitcase aboard her flight. This is the story of Earl Cook and the airplane bombing. I'm Tommy Henry, and this is the Chicago History Podcast. Naperville, Illinois is a suburb about 33 miles west and slightly south of downtown Chicago. These days, it is known for its inclusion in many best places in the U.S. to live lists. Although Naperville's population is, as of this writing, close to 149,000 residents, back in the 60s, it was still a pretty quiet area. The 1960 census shows 12,933 residents. By 1970, it had jumped to 22,794. In 1967, the Cook family, Earl, 37, his wife Jean, 35, and their two teenage sons, Earl Jr. and Stephen, were living in Naperville on Webster Street, full of trees, good-sized yards, and sidewalks. Earl even owned a four-seat airplane. Earl, with an E at the end, had a job managing a Coca-Cola bottling plant in nearby St. Charles, Illinois, with a salary of $16,000 per year, that's a little more than $124,000 in today's money. His wife, Jean, had had some medical issues and had stopped being a teacher at Granger Elementary School. On the morning of November 12, 1967, Jean was getting ready for a trip to Southern California to see her parents. And being a loving husband, husband Earl drove her to the airport. At the airport, Earl checked Jean's bags while she waited at the gate and returned with two claim tickets for her. When Jean's flight was called, Earl kissed her goodbye as she got ready to board American Airlines Flight 455. That flight carried 75 passengers, three of them infants, and six crew members. Somewhere over Alamoso, Colorado, at 34,500 feet, the pilot, Captain Dwayne C. Duncan of Barrington, Illinois, heard a muffled and felt a noticeable jolt. In his 24 years of flying, he had never heard a noise like this. There was a slight change in the pressure in the baggage compartment, but as the plane continued without any significant issues, Duncan assumed that the plane had hit a downdraft or a shift in baggage had caused one or more suitcases to fall and bang against the bulkhead of the plane. Duncan and his flight crew checked their instruments, finding everything in order. Over the intercom, the pilot reassured passengers, including Mrs. Jean Cook, that, quote, everything is all right, Apparently, we encountered a bump in the air, end quote. Flight 455 continued on, landing safely at its destination in San Diego. As the baggage handlers opened the plane's storage compartment, they immediately smelled what seemed to be the fumes from ignited gunpowder. Inspecting further, they found damaged luggage and scattered debris throughout the cargo hold. Unloading of the baggage was delayed as a call was put into the FBI's San Diego field office. A special agent from that office named Robert Sundquist arrived first on the scene. In the debris of the cargo hold, Sundquist found two sticks of dynamite, four exploded detonator caps, a large six-volt battery, two alarm clocks with attached wiring, remnants of a white vinyl suitcase with a lock bearing the trademark Cheney England, and three, three loose baggage claim straps. 
The tarmac quickly filled with FBI agents ready to get statements. A tech team boxed the evidence for a shipment to Washington, D.C.'s FBI lab. It was pretty clear to all on hand that day that the bombing was intended to bring the plane down. The question was, why? A terrorist act? A murder attempt? Suicide? As Special Agent Sunquist checked the three loose baggage claim tags, he noticed two of them belonged to one of the passengers, someone listed as Mrs. Cook. The number showing on the third claim tag was one number above the two tags belonging to Mrs. Cook. That claim strap had also been checked in with Mrs. Cook's other bags. Sunquist needed to talk to Mrs. Cook, who had been released and was currently at her parents' home in El Cajon, a suburb of San Diego. A little historical background for you. The first recorded case of airplane sabotage occurred in October of 1933. A plane traveling from New York to Chicago crashed five miles outside of Chesterton, Indiana, about 54 miles south and east of downtown Chicago, killing four passengers and three crew on board. Roughly three weeks later, FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover announced they had a person of interest, a gangster, who allegedly left the bomb on the plane tucked into some blankets. The gangster had allegedly left it on the plane as he thought he would be searched after the previous flight on which he was on and didn't intend for it to go off. In the years between that incident in 1933 and the 1967 one 34 years later, little had changed regarding keeping flyers safe. More on that later. Back to Gene Cook, FBI agents headed to Al Cajon to interview Mrs. Cook. They were able to find her at her parents' home, sitting with her mother and father in the living room. When investigators asked Gene Cook what she knew about the white vinyl suitcase, she appeared surprised by the question, answering, quote, Why, nothing. I don't own such a suitcase, just two tan bags. I have them here, end quote. When told of the white suitcase checked on her ticket, Jean Cook said, quote, Impossible. My husband checked in my luggage, just the two tan bags. It took him the longest time. Thank God he only had two pieces or it would have taken him forever, end quote. When asked if the marriage was a happy one, Jean Cook replied, Earl and I love each other very much. When interviewed the next day, Earl Cook, a man described as, quote, a stocky, aggressive man with a crew cut and horn-rimmed glasses, proudly identified himself as the manager of the Coca-Cola bottling plant in St. Charles, Illinois. FBI agents asked him about the white suitcase. Cook denied knowing anything about it, saying he only checked two bags for his wife. When pressed about the third bag, according to the book Inside the FBI by Andrew Tully, Earl Cook became, quote, red-faced with anger, saying, I don't know where you got your crazy information. I'm a respectable and well-to-do businessman. I love my wife to distraction. I'd die if anything happened to her. Cook then reportedly took out a handkerchief and wiped his eyes. Trying to calm the situation, the investigators told Cook they were not accusing him of any crime, but they were required to ask questions of everyone connected to the flight. Cook relaxed and invited those on hand to, quote, drop in and see my plant. It's a marvel of technology and production know-how, end quote. Back in Washington, an FBI explosives and tool expert named Charles L. Killian examined the pieces recovered, including the two small alarm clocks, and found that when one of them went off, the hammer that hits the bell completed the circuit, which caused the four electric caps to detonate. Killian concluded the second clock was used as a fail-safe in case the first one did not work. His assessment was that the device should have exploded, but as the blasting caps had been clumsily inserted into the dynamite, they likely became dislodged, possibly when the baggage handlers were loading the suitcases. The next time you fly and feel those airport guys are treating luggage too rough, remember that in this instance, it likely saved 81 lives. Killian's report noted that as the fuel lines and control wiring were directly above the baggage compartment, had this device detonated, it surely would have resulted in a fire and caused the plane to crash. According to Killian, in his report, quote, 
there would have been extensive damage caused to the baggage compartment and to any equipment that might be in the area, end quote. Continuing their look into the Cook family and their connection to the bomb aboard Flight 455, the FBI found that before moving to Naperville, Earl and Jean Cook lived in Houston, Texas. Reaching out to the Houston office, the investigators found something interesting in their files. In 1964, three years before the plane bombing, a man named George Cliff, a professional gambler from Hot Springs, Arkansas, had reported to the FBI that Earl Cook had paid him $500 to murder Gene Cook. The tip had been passed on to Agent Robert Hickam, who had used Cliff as a paid informant on several occasions. According to Hickam, quote, he's pretty reliable. I've never known him to sell me any phony merchandise, end quote. The tip was passed on to the Houston Police Department, who could not corroborate the info, and it appeared to be dropped. When Flight 455 was bombed, investigators reached out to George Cliff once again. Then, 72 and frail, he was found at a gambling club, still in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Elaborating on his original story, Cliff explained he was posing as a private detective when he met Cook in November of 1963. According to Cliff, Cook claimed his wife was making the rounds with other men and he wanted a divorce. He paid Cliff $250 to go to Houston to get evidence on Gene Cook. When Cliff arrived in Houston five days later, Earl Cook told him he changed his mind. He no longer wanted a divorce. His reason? He said his company would not approve and he might get fired. His new idea was that he wanted Cliff to kill his wife. Cliff told Earl Cook he wasn't a killer but knew someone in St. Louis who could do the job and make it look like an accident. Cook gave Cliff $1,250 and a picture of Gene Cook. Cook also promised Cliff half of a $10,000 life insurance policy after she was gone. When asked what Cliff did after this, he said he pocketed the money. In January of 1964, Cliff went to the local FBI office to report all of this. Cliff was quoted as saying, I guess the FBI tipped off the Houston police all right because a couple of months later, Cook came back to Hot Springs and told me the Houston cops pulled him in to ask him about wanting to kill his wife. He said he laughed at them, said the cops didn't have any evidence except for what somebody told the FBI, so they had to let him go. Anyway, he said his wife was still alive. Cliff figured that was the end of it, but later that summer, Cook flew down to Hot Springs in his four-seater plane with a new plan. He wanted Cliff to go to El Cajon, California, and kill his wife with a rifle while she stayed with her parents. Days later, without leaving town, Cliff told Earl T. Cook he had gone to California, quote, but the neighborhood was lousy with cops, end quote, so he didn't get it done. The ever-persistent Cook showed up again a few weeks later and suggested maybe Cliff could arrange to get his wife drowned. Cook also devised a bomb that could be rigged with flashlight batteries and asked Cliff to get it on a plane with Gene Cook on board. Cliff said to the investigators, quote, Hell, I told him the plane would be loaded with people, but that didn't faze him. He told me, that's their trouble, not mine, end quote. Cliff continued to see Cook over the next few months, perhaps as many as eight times, admitting to FBI agents he had no plans to assist in any murder, but, quote, got some dough out of him every time, end quote. The FBI realized this guy might have some credibility issues, even if his stories had a ring of truth to them. Back in Naperville, neighbors gave the standard, their nice family, but keep to themselves line at the Coca-Cola plant Cook managed. His employees described him as pleasant, but standoffish. As anyone who enjoys true crime stories knows, investigators always follow the money. In this case, they found Earl Cook 
would have collected $117,500 in life insurance, which is more than $900,000 in today's money. $77,500 of that had been bought or renewed since September of 1966, about 14 months before the plane incident. A $40,000 Shell oil policy went into effect on November 1st of that year, less than two weeks before the attempted bombing. On Friday, November 17th, 1967, during an interview with an FBI agent named Thomas W. Parrish, Cook again insisted he had only checked two bags with one skycap. He also denied he and his wife had ever had any marital difficulties, and then admitted he and his wife had separated for about a month when they lived in Houston. Cook also claimed to have no knowledge of dynamite, but then revealed he had learned about blasting caps growing up in Arizona, where his father owned a rock salt mine. Later that day, according to an article in the Chicago Tribune, FBI agents armed with a search warrant went through the Cook home in Naperville. What they turned up in the basement of the house on Webster Street included components for a bomb that identically matched those found. On Flight 455, Earl Cook was arrested. While Cook spent two days in the Cook County Jail awaiting arraignment on the charge of placing a bomb aboard a plane with intent to damage, destroy, disable, or wreck it, the FBI continued their search of the house. What they turned up was more wiring and a vice, all of which were sent to Agent Killian, the explosives and tool expert with the FBI, in Washington for inspection. Killian used 1967 microscopic examinations to confirm the vice found in Cook's home matched the tool marks on the bell of the alarm clock used in the plane bomb. Killian also confirmed the wiring found in the home matched the wiring recovered from the baggage hold of the plane. They also found a key with the trademark Cheney England, the same trademark found on the lock of the white suitcase about which Earl T. Cook claimed to know nothing. Of course, the key fit perfectly. At the start of Earl T. Cook's trial in late January of 1968, observers were surprised to see Earl and Mrs. Jean Cook embracing in the courtroom. Assistant United States Attorney Richard Schultz complained to Judge Richard B. Austin of, quote, these ridiculous scenes, quote, between the couple. Judge Austin agreed that the conduct was improper and might influence jurors, but Jean Cook ended up being excused from the courtroom on the legal ground she might be a witness for the defense. During the trial, it was revealed Cook had, shocker, other women in his life, including a few referred to as call girls. When asked about Hot Springs, Arkansas gambler George Cliff and the money Cook gave him, Earl Cook explained that he gave George Cliff $800 to cover gambling losses. Not one, but two O'Hare Skycaps testified and identified Earl Cook as the man who gave one of them two tan suitcases and the other Skycap one white vinyl case at the airport that morning. It was also revealed during the trial that Cook had approached a local Naperville man in 1966 about carrying out the murder of his wife, Jean. Jean Cook spent her time during the trial sitting in the corridor outside the courtroom, knitting, telling anyone who stopped how much she loved her husband. With Cook free on a $100,000 bond, the Cooks left the court arm in arm every night. When Jean Cook was finally called to the witness stand, even after all of the prosecution witnesses testified about her husband's numerous attempts to have her killed, Jean Cook maintained he was innocent, calling him, quote, a good man who has always been good and kind to me. Assistant U.S. Attorney Schultz felt differently about Earl T. Cook, calling him, quote, subhuman. Schultz was quoted as saying, You saw how he did it. You saw the dynamite. You saw how he put that ugly machine together. Can you imagine a human being doing that? 
On Tuesday, February 6, 1968, after deliberating only three and a half hours, the jury, consisting of seven men and five women, found Earl T. Cook guilty of trying to blow up the airliner on which his wife was a passenger. At Cook's sentencing of two concurrent 20-year terms, Judge Richard B. Austin said about Cook, He has shown a wicked, depraved, and abandoned heart. He will be taken into custody, not only for his wife's protection, but for the protection of the whole community. He has sacrificed his right to remain free. Earl Cook maintained his innocence throughout the trial, even telling Judge Austin, I feel that I have been given a fair trial under a system I believe in. I believe in our form of government. The only thing I'm sorry about is that I am innocent. The evidence presented didn't quite portray my innocence. Under law, Judge Austin was unable to make the terms consecutive, but indicated he wished he could. Quote, The only reason there wasn't a mass murder here was something for which he, meaning Cook, had no control. End quote. Earl Cook was not the first person to try to kill someone by using a bomb on a plane. Nearly 20 years earlier, in 1949, 32-year-old Joseph Albert Guay of Canada put a bomb in his wife's luggage, blowing up a Canadian Pacific Airlines flight near Quebec, killing 19 passengers and four crew members. The suspected motive? A lover's quarrel. On July 17, 1970, New Orleans International Airport became the first to use metal detectors in its security efforts. On August 5, 1974, Congress passed the Air Transportation Security Act requiring metal detectors and X-ray screening of carry-on, just carry-on, bags at all U.S. airports. It wasn't until the deaths of 270 people in the Lockerbie bombing of Pan Am Flight 103 over Scotland in 1988 that U.S. carriers began screening all baggage, including check bags. Even more bonkers, government-issued IDs to get on flights didn't become mandatory until after TWA Flight 800 crashed in July of 1996. The incidents of September 11, 2001 tightened airport security even further and brought about the creation of the Transportation Security Administration, or TSA. Thank you for listening to today's episode about Earl Cook and the airplane bombing. If you've enjoyed this episode or previous ones, I'd sure appreciate you leaving a review. As always, I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions about anything covered today, anything to add, or have a different topic you think might be a good fit for a future episode of the Chicago History Podcast. I can be reached by email at chicagohistorypod at gmail.com. I will have plenty of pictures and news clippings related to the story on Instagram and on Facebook. Give us a follow and check it out. Too busy to type an email? Go to chicagohistorypod.com and in the lower right corner, click on the microphone icon. With that, you can leave me a voice message. Get out and explore when possible. Learn more about whatever city you live in and stay safe.